Namo tassa bhagavato arahato summa sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato summa sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato summa sambuddhasa. Udang damang sangang namasami. So there's a compilation of nonfiction articles I read, um, I think during my last year of college by an, a journalist named Gene Weingarten. And he's well known for a variety of pretty amazing um, pieces of journalism. One of them that I was most moved by was uh, a social experiment he did where they invited Joshua Bell, who, um, and I'm sure some of you know this story, um, is one of the preeminent uh, violinists in the world and a prodigy by all accounts. So they invited him the night after he just played in, you know, uh, front of the elite music uh, lovers of New York for a hundred dollars a seat or more on a Stradivarius that costs, you know, upwards of a hundred thousand um, dollars. They invited him to take a day and just busk in a New York subway and in regular clothes and to see what happens or what happened. And there's a video of it where you see this man playing the violin on the side and everyone passing him and not really stopping. And at first glance, it, he looks like a ghost until you realize uh, in the words of the article that it's everyone else who are ghosts actually, because though in, I think they had him bus for quite a, quite a while, several hours, and over a thousand people passed, um, almost no one stopped, except for kids. And there were several children, um, actually routinely, the children who passed would try to stop and they were usually dragged on by their parents or um, something. So this might be the most um, damning example of the beauty and transcendence which can rest right in our view that we fail to see over time because our attention and our gaze become jaded and narrowed. And the gaze of appropriate attention tends to be broad, uh, gentle, warm. Um, and it's not just the usual defilements that a narrowed and defilement threaded gaze opens us to. One of the more pervasive defilements and taints on our vision and world that we modern people experience is simply a claustrophobia and absolute scarcity of time which might have been what was manifesting uh, mostly in that subway, is you have places to be and things to do and how can you stop for something that's not part of that plan? Um, you know, the prediction in uh, early 20th century was that in a hundred years, uh, people would only have to work about 15 hours a week. Um, and then the big problem would be figuring out what to do with all of our spare time. and that's not quite played out. 
uh, people have less spare time than ever. Um, and in 2013, several Dutch scientists postulated that even our estimates, people's estimates of how busy they were was uh, based on surveys was inaccurate because most people were too busy to take the surveys. So that's nice. And this pathway back into people encounter this path of practice initially and hear about the first noble truth, uh, acknowledging suffering and can conceive of the path as a dour one, but it should be a bright path. Um, paradoxically, when we turn towards suffering, we also turn towards the brightness which lies just beyond that suffering. And so as we kind of move um, into this path and carefully and practically learn to direct our attention and our gaze in a way that brings into being a world worthy of us and that we can be worthy of, um, we find that it is a path in the words of the Buddha that's good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good at the end. Um, there's a uh, instrumental form of the word for happiness, sukhena in Pali, which means by happiness. By happiness, one achieves happiness. So this is relevant because um, you know, to go over that list of 10 uses of, of appropriate attention, again, you have reflecting in terms of causes and conditions, uh, reflecting in terms of component parts. The next ones, which we haven't touched on yet, include reflecting on phenomena in terms of the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and not self, reflecting on things in terms of Four Noble Truths, reflecting on things in terms of um, activities and their purpose, reflecting on things in terms of the, their true and false benefit, reflecting on phenomena in terms of their attraction, their drawback and their escape, in terms of uh, arousing wholesome mental qualities, in terms of staying in the present moment, and in terms of analytical conversation. This next one, number three, of reflecting on phenomena and experience in terms of the three characteristics is of impermanence, suffering, and not self, anicca, anatta, and dukkha, is one that gets um, it's hard not to perceive at first as a bit of a downer. <laughs> and there's part of it, yes, that takes real stock of the situation. And when one directs one's attention this way, it, it allows one to achieve a state of equipoise. Um, it, it said that the proper responses to anicca, to impermanence, are composure and commitment. That's worth repeating. The proper responses to anicca are composure and commitment. And composure is effectively um, equanimity, equipoise, which is one of the most refined of the mental states in Buddhism. It's, um, it is sort of the crown of many lists. And it can seem, if one doesn't know what it means, coarse or heartless. Um, I spoke about this at the last weekend retreat we had. 
Ajahn Amaro once was asked what the difference was between equanimity, this quality of composure and indifference. And he said that equanimity doesn't have the meh quality. So there's no meh. <laughs> it's, and this is why I like the word equipoise more because, and this is Bonte Analio's translation, because equipoise has, it's the moment poise is not a indifferent state. When a dancer stops their movement for a second and say between sections of a score, it's not with a sense of indifference. It's rather a careful taking stock of where one is, of catching one's breath and deciding what the next movement should be. And equanimity is just that. Um, it's the ability to step back and acknowledge the limits of our control and of our capacities. And the acknowledgement of the imperfection of the world and the people we live with and in. So, there's a reason it's one of the Brahma Viharas, uh, the boundless abodes of loving kindness, because it should be imbued with a sense of care. But it's that moving back for a second when you realize there's nothing you can do in that exact moment and waiting for a moment when you can do something. And ironically, sometimes this is exactly the motion of the heart that's needed to still love the world because the world is imperfect and we can't always change and mold it to our desires. So when one looks at impermanence, suffering, not self, it's exactly this recollection which can lead one to take that wholesome step back and see that, you know, I recently visited uh, my sister and, um, you know, uh, she works at Silicon Valley and um, certain opinions of hers, like all my relatives, don't match with mine. And family dynamics are always fun. We're just coming out of Christmas season. So I'm sure many have had, you know, loving experience with this recently. And the ability to step back and let another person be their own person is such a gift, but it requires acknowledging that they're changing, they're out of our control. That means they're not, it's anatta. And it's imperfect. We're all flawed, dukkha. And sometimes this is especially the emotion of heart that's needed with the people closest to us for loving kindness to manifest. With those who are closest to me, like my parents, what lets that fresh breath of metta in so often is not looking at them as my relatives or someone, the self is too entwined. But to step back and say they're, you know, to look at them instead for a second as friends in birth, aging, and death, and this path. If I can step back and just think of them that much, then I can let them have their freedom to be what they are and who they are. And that's real love. And this applies to the world as a whole. Um, There's a place we try to affect change as we're able, but there really is also a moment where one can remember that samsara is samsara is samsara, and that it just can't be the whole story, that there's something else going on, and that we will never be able to perfect it completely. And that lets us be in this imperfect world without suffering in that way, always. And more than that, if we look at it in terms of the Buddhist path, then these qualities of anicca, anatta, and dukkha 
are a great gift, actually. In the story of the Bodhisattva's life, the major turning point is when he sees what he refers to as the divine messengers, the Deva Dutta, a sick person, an old person, a corpse. And um, in the commentarial mythology, a renunciant. And I think the texts are completely sincere in naming those first three heavenly divine messengers in a sense. Because what the greatest danger pointed to in so many of the teachings is, is heedlessness. And it's pointed to as the prime pitfall of the heavenly realms, the deva realms, which I think overlays quite nicely onto uh, middle-class America to some extent. And is that people become careless and they forget to practice. And in a sense, everything that falls apart in our hands, you genuinely can look at it with appropriate attention as the world just trying to make you turn towards something more worthy of you. Because we wouldn't if we weren't forced to. So it's a great kindness, you know, in a sense, and I've used this phrase before, the world is falling apart in its eagerness to show us what lies underneath. But to see this, it requires also, um, and it's, it's not a painless process, you know, uh, Ajahn Achilo, one of my teachers in Thailand, or a teacher in Thailand, talks about um, staying at the monastery where I ordained long ago and just getting so fed up with things one day that he put his robe over his head and just sort of screamed for a while and then ran up to my teacher, uh, Ajahn Anand, and said, when will it be better? And Ajahn Anand said, in five years, it'll be a little bit better. So the path is slow and slower, but compared to slower, slow is fast. And the changes that are happening are profound. But in a sense, we have to be burned by the world again and again for to stop holding on to it so tightly and to give it some freedom. Um, Ajahn Chah said that 80% of the practice is knowing we need to let go of something and not being able to. So that's the state to an extent. And yet what we're moving towards is truly a transcendence of heart that lies beyond that. And this is the importance of, we only can see these qualities of Anicca, Anatta and Dukkha clearly if our mind and heart feels it has something else to rest on. Um, so this is why we cultivate these other uh, refuges in our life, why we cultivate morality, why we cultivate a sense of well-being from meditation, spiritual friendship, um, and why we try whenever we can to visit uh, really beings who have progressed far along the path so that we gain some intuition of what the transcendent heart looks like, of what an enlightened being looks like. And they exist now, Westerners, um, nearby, <laughs> I think, uh, certainly within visiting range of our you know, globalized world. And it's worth taking the time to try to go see some of these monastics. And this applies on the microcosm of meditation very clearly too. 
is that the process of refining the mind is one of using initially quite coarse mental objects to focus the mind and then seeing as the mind becomes more refined, how those objects are too coarse, too changing. And if one is agile enough and attuned, then one lets go of them and moves to a more refined object. And so this is the process in say mindfulness of breathing is initially you might be following the breath tracking its length, just the coarse breath at the nose or in the lungs, maybe even accompanying it with a mantra. And then over time, the mantra becomes too coarse. One sees it as suffering, dukkha in the sense of stress, a little bit coarse, um, sees it as impermanent. Say a, a mantra is very, it's a robust object, but it's constantly changing and you have to keep it going. And the calm that is sort of beginning to grow underneath it is more refined. There's less dukkha in it, less stress. There's less in Nietzsche, it's much more constant. Similarly, when one relinquishes that feeling of say the breath as the coarse wind and looks more towards the breath energy, that's similarly a much smoother, consistent um, meditative object. And you can feel this in other aspects of meditation too. Uh, as the breath becomes refined, sometimes what we call a light nimitta will begin to make its way into the visual field where, and people miss it because they're expecting to see kind of a ball of light, but instead just notice when the entire visual field becomes brighter. That's the light nimitta, the light sign. And Ajahn Fung would call that the sign of the, the light of the breath. And you can foreground that and just keep the breath in the background. And that's a similar motion of seeing the coarseness of a previous meditation object and looking towards a, a more refined object um, that's less entwined with the three characteristics. And it takes a bit of faith because sometimes these objects and these refuges in our life and our meditation, they're quieter. So they take a while to see. Similarly with something like the sound of silence, um, it's a constant and steady object, but it's refined. So it's helpful to have a tiered practice where you have very robust baseline meditative objects that you always have available, like a mantra that really hits home for you. Um, Budo, love, God, whatever it is. And then you know that if your mind is still a mess, maybe you need even a more kind of coarse object, like an actual walking meditation, for example. But if the mind gets more refined, then you know you have these other tiers of practice where you can move to just um, the feeling of loving kindness or of calm or the sound of silence. You know, you can see this whole dynamic very clearly when you drop a initiating image for metta, say the image of someone you love, um, or a powerful image for metta is imagining someone as a child and at, on their deathbed and holding their hand in both of those places. But once you get that glow of metta going, you can acknowledge that, that image as dukkha, coarse, anicca, impermanent, changeable, and anatta, it's, it's quite distant from us and let it go and come to that more refined object of meditation. The Four Noble Truths are the next. And these are one of the most powerful teachings of the Buddhist path. 
the Buddha said that he gave two categorical teachings, which are always appropriate to apply. And those two are the four right efforts and the four noble truths. They're always appropriate. And most of you may know this, but the translation of the four noble truths, which is so often given is problematic in that frequently it's, they're translated as simply life is suffering. And then, you know, suffering has a cause, et cetera. But it's important to acknowledge that each noble truth comes with a task. So the task of the first noble truth is to comprehend our suffering. The task of the second is to let go of its source, which is craving. The task of the third is to realize its cessation, nirvana. And the task of the fourth is to develop its path, the noble eightfold path. And the importance of that first step can't be overstated. Because we have no problem wanting to kind of revel in, you know, the peace of the third noble truth when it's available. And we love the idea of cultivating the path, really giving ourselves to the practice. But if we do either of those things without first just stopping and feeling our own bruised hearts and our own suffering, then every other aspect of the path is a means to spiritual bypass. So this is why before engaging in metta practice and shooting out those metta rays at those people who need it so badly, you know, and good for you. <laughs> I'm being facetious, but we can do that very easily. But to acknowledge that quite frequently, real good metta practice requires us to be nimble on our feet and just time and again, turn it back on ourselves and realize that our hearts are the ones that are bruised. And just to let it, um, most of us come out of the lives we live quite um, traumatized and burdened day after day. And to let that ring for a time. Um, and yet this movement towards looking at our own suffering is, uh, it's powerful and it can be actually joyful in itself um, because there's no neutral stance towards suffering. Either we're running from it um, or we're running towards it. And I've uh, referenced this before, but that story of Chogyong Trungpa who was traveling to an abbey in Tibet and with an entourage of uh, lamas and one of the Tibetan mastiffs broke its chain and charged the whole group. And everyone else ran away from the Mastiff, but Chogyam Trungpa ran straight at it and it got scared and ran away from him. So we need to run towards suffering or move towards it. That's the only way um, to really uh, encounter it. And um, Ajahn Sumedho talks about his first years at Amravati, uh, and things were pretty miserable, apparently. You know, it was quite cold. They were alone there, um, and things were just down. And so what he did was he made everyone, right when they took, got up, um, take a cold shower. I know I talk a lot about cold showers, but this is Ajahn Sumedho's words. And, um, and that changed everything, the whole mood. So there's something to be said for, like, diving right into that difficulty. And when you do that, you find that those other three truths open up. And this also applies in the same way that I was speaking of with meditation, where with the three characteristics, where when one contemplates the three characteristics in a meditation object, it, it's really the same as applying the Four Noble Truths to that object too seeing the suffering in a meditative stage and letting go of it and moving to the next stage, the third noble truth of, of a new level of peace. And then cultivating in that new stage, um, a familiarity and effort.
And this is why Samatha and Vipassana practice, tranquility and insight aren't really separate in this sense. Because say, as one's moving through the stages of mindfulness of breathing, it's a stage of constantly skimming the coarseness, the dukkha off the surface and letting go of it little by little and coming to more and more fine states. But that's a process of insight and of calm. And another very important use of the Four Noble Truths and of contemplating things in terms of them is externally, in that so much of the difficulty in the world comes from the suffering of those who initiate it, including ourselves. So compassion can usually be accessed by tracing back a problematic pattern or behavior to the initiating wound. So instead of looking at the rival political party as, you know, hell bent on bringing down the country or something like that, whatever your political leaning is, instead, can you trace that behavior back to the initiating wound? And that might be a jobless and opioid. addicted rust belt that watch is watching themselves be left behind by other aspects of society. And how could there not be rage there? Or if you're on a different side of the political spectrum, you know, perhaps tracing back the initiating wound there is um, seeing a people um, in the cities who are have been isolated and robbed of many systems of meaning that they've had and sense of community. And um, I'm not sure how that relates, but there's real suffering there too, you know? And that's where we can find compassion um, and really bowing to that and meeting there. I know some people would take a picture of their rival political leader and place it on their altar and bow to it every morning. I think that's quite good, maybe below the Buddha, but, but it's not a bad idea because that's your teacher for compassion. So the, four, the first noble truth can be used that way as well. And the final one I think I'll touch on in this talk maybe is looking at things in terms of what are called Dhamma and Atta, or principles and their purpose. So what this refers to is using appropriate attention to look at every aspect of the path as a means towards something else. And what this does is it lets us not hold any of the aspects in isolation, but balance them against others and make sure that they're according with the underlying principles of the practice as a whole. So, you know, the Buddha said that just as the ocean has one taste, that of salt, so all my teachings have one taste, that of freedom. So if we're practicing and we find ourselves becoming constricted, harsh, knotted, we know that even if on the surface, the practice, whatever we're doing, maybe it's pulling back from people around us. Maybe it's throwing ourselves into meditation a little too hard. Um, we know that we've gone off because the practice, the Dhamma, isn't in line with the underlying purpose, the Atta, the benefit. So, you know, and the Buddha lays out what each part of the path is clearly supposed to lead to, what its purpose is. Restraint is for the sake of freedom from remorse. Freedom of remorse freedom from remorse, 
is for the sake of joy. Joy is for the sake of rapture. Rapture is for the sake of tranquility. Tranquility is for the sake of concentration. Concentration is for the sake of knowledge and vision of the way things are. Knowledge and vision is for the sake of release and for knowledge and vision of release. So this is important in terms of seeing when we um, lose our way. And people can get quite tied up in knots. And um, it really helps us balance stuff. You know, for example, ascetic practice or just sitting meditation many hours a day. If one senses that these practices are getting knotted up and tight, then you know that they've come out of tune with the other aspects of the path. And that's when it's really important to cultivate the bright aspects um, of faith, of giving. This is a robust path of many different pieces. And although we do lean towards meditation and love it, um, at least most of the people who are here probably lean that way, um, the aspects of giving, you know, or of community are enormous, of coming into contact with spiritual friends. And sometimes that's more what we need as uh, Westerners, mixing sort of an ascetic fire brimstone teaching with a modern, you know, original sin riddled, self-flagellating Western mentality is like mixing acid with acid. It doesn't end well. And it's also worth realizing that this aligns with seeing the real purpose of all pieces of our lives. Because not all of us are going to be able to, you know, our, our paths are not to become monastics or to spend a lot of time in a monastery. But any life, if used as a tool for awakening, is being used correctly. The practice is in line with the underlying principles of Dhamma of our life. And in a sense, we reach through our world to touch the transcendent. And that can sound just poetic, but it's very real. Um, one practitioner in the Sangha here was set on ordaining. And um, he had a son, and but his son would be taken care of, all right. And this sort of fractured him uh, for a long time until finally he took that step and went to these monasteries seeing if he could ordain. And um, one of the teachers he went to see said, no, you've got this karma, you have to honor it and go home and, you know, be with your son until the end um, or until he's grown up. So he did. And I've never seen someone, Buddha Dasa says that Dhamma is duty. And seeing how this practitioner was able to take a state of mind where he believed that he was compromising his real path by not ordaining, and understanding instead that his life was, could be used in the service of this higher principle, this purpose, in a very real sense, and that that was his path. He came to complete peace with it. And I've met few people as monastic as him. I think he might be more monastic than me. And um, he, basically talked about how his whole life now is really caring. I mean, he practices a huge amount, but most of his life is spent loving his son and being the best father he can be. And he uses the first three paramitas, spiritual perfections, as almost a mantra. And those three are dana, giving, 
sila, morality, and nekama, renunciation. So he said that constantly in every situation in my life now, I just ask myself, what can I give? That's Donna. How can I act perfectly? That's Sila. And what can I give up? That's Nekama. So it's the strangest thing, but so often our path is right, right here, and we look past it. And Ajahn Pasna said that all the time that we miss peace because we look past it constantly. We are not given our karma for no reason. You can look at karma as a series of unfortunate circumstances you have to muddle your way through. Or you can look at your karma as the lesson that the universe is meaning to teach you. And there's a path of purity in Dhamma that runs through every situation, as evidenced by the fact that an arahant can move through any situation purely. So can you find that thread in your own life? Because it's there. And that's what looking at experience in terms of the practice and the principles and realizing what our life is for the sake of and aligning it with those deeper principles and always remembering what its purpose is and reaching through the purported easy to see purpose of getting a raise, raising a child well, even something as noble as that, to the real purpose, which is always enlightenment and purifying the heart and healing the world as much as you can, reaching through each of these individual loves to touch a larger love. The next use of appropriate attention was looking at things in terms of their true and false benefit. But really it's just the same as what I just talked about. Realizing that constantly there's these counterfeit benefits raised up to distract us. A middle-class life, a modicum of happiness. And to remember always that the real benefit is those underlying principles that everything else is for the sake of. That's the real benefit and to keep our eye on that and to make a shrine in your house and bow to that every morning because we do forget. And so it's also a great kindness that the world is constantly falling apart because that's what lets us not get diluted in the end. So appropriate attention has, you know, it's like having two eyes that gives you depth, depth perception. Those reflections on Anicca, Anatta, and Dukkha and of the Four Noble Truths, like one eye is seeing the drawbacks, seeing through the veil, even as the other eye, looking at things in terms of their underlying principles of awakening, looking at things in terms of their true value, that's the other eye that sees the transcendent beyond the conditioned realm. And our task and our difficulty, difficulty and our blessing as practitioners is having to hold those two truths in mind at the same time. But we can. And if we do that, we find that the world moves from being a flat landscape to one with depth and breadth and a field of blessings. So we're returning to a flat Zoom screen. Hand myang damakataya sadu karam dada mase sadu 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 anu modami. So we now. We we now have a very long period for meditation for those who would um, like to try and develop some samadhi. Um, this is your chance. Sangamita, I have down a brief Q&A for the end oh, of this. So you. My apologies. Yes, Q&A first and then the long meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so open for questions. 
raise your digital hand so you pop up to the top, if you would. Wendy? Wendy, I think you're muted, but you might know that. But I don't know if you know that. Oh, no, 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 you're muted again. Oh, you're, yeah, that's there I am. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, no, I just have a couple of questions about uh, walking meditation. Um, uh, first of all, is there, is there any uh, problem with walking um, with your arms down rather than holding them in front? Just down at your side, I'm saying. No, no, it, it's okay. Um, it's not a big deal. The clasping them in front tends to be slightly unnatural, which is good um, because it keeps you, this is a decent principle with some of these unorthodox postures is that adding a, a element of unnaturalness kind of keeps you mindful. So, oh, okay. and so that, that goes for lying down meditation or sitting in a chair meditation, but especially lying down is you can do it, but you have to make the determination to not move. And that makes it pretty uncomfortable after a while, which makes it meditation and not a nap. So the difficulty is making it not a stroll, but walking meditation. So it's okay to do it either way, but it's good to, that's the reason for the clasped hands if it's not too uncomfortable. Okay. No, it's not that it's uncomfortable. It's just that I, uh, my, my sense of balance is, uh, getting progressively worse and uh, um, somehow uh, having them together. <laughs> you should you should do the thing that lets you not fall down. And <laughs> in, in Thailand, we'll, we'll stay up one night a week usually for all night meditation. And, uh, and you sort of see the monks try to do walking meditation and they get like pretty swervy. I've definitely like fallen over before. So yeah, not alone. Uh, okay. The other thing... Um, I was wondering about uh, the walking meditation is I find that I'm kind of um, I'm focused on three things. Actually, it seems like mm. I'm focused on the breath. Oh, I'm focused on the soles of the feet, the breath and um, inner sound. Mm. So uh, is that a problem? Should I try to uh, narrow it down more than that? No, so a decent way to, usually you'll have several objects um, when the mind's in, even if you don't really realize it, it's usually the case. Uh, so it, it's fine. If you want that sense of naturalness and uh, yeah, the mind's in this has a lot of energy. Um, so, you know, for example, even in breath meditation, after say the mind has moved around a lot, um, for me, I could never settle in one spot initially. And I asked Ajahn Jeff about it. And he said, look, if that's the case, just split the awareness between two, two points, like the top of the head and the tailbone. Um, so splitting awareness is one way of kind of, we've got a lot of energy and it, it helps. So using those three is fine. I find conceptualizing um, practice a bit as a dish is good. So you do want to have your rice, like whatever you is your baseline, usually like an object that's really there, but then frequently you'll add flavorings on top, depending. Um, so it's useful to figure out which of those objects feels the most, like the other stuff sort of slides off over time, but it feel your way and trust your into intuition around it. Yeah. Okay. So whatever feels the strongest I suppose I don't know what to say but uh... I, I would um you know sort of as you're walking um see which of those your mind is sort of gravitating more, more towards and let the other ones drop um as they feel kind of clunky and forced is a bit of a secret I think okay yeah okay um, thank you thank yeah. you
Gab Gabrielle? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, John. Um, the question this morning around um, bhava or becoming and the restlessness of the mind and, um, and you spoke of nutriment mm. and um, uh, you explained that uh, in uh, the sitting practice or the meditation, we're, we're um, cutting off that first nutriment of contact. Mm. And then um, it um, uh, uh, sort of becomes, or, or, or the, the, I don't know if it's a sequential. Um, I, I kind of wanted to run out and, and find out more about nutriment, but I restrained myself. <laughs> um, but um, when you, you spoke of intention, and um, and I wasn't. Uh, um, I, I guess I'm a little bit unclear as to what that means in regard to nutriment, because nutriment. Am I correct in understanding that uh, the nutriments the Buddha mentions are are the foods that we want to withdraw from the mind in order to bring about the peace of the heart? Um, and so, um, oh, now I've lost my thread, my question. Um, so I guess where I'm finding it a bit unclear is that with intention as nutriment, there's also intention in the path as in uh, right intention. And so I wonder if you could just sort of expand a bit on that because we're not, they're not the same, I would guess. Yeah, so, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, first, the sutta that you should look up is Samyutta Nikaya 1264, Putamansa Sutta. It's called the Sun's Flesh. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty brutal sutta, but it's amazing, um, really something. Um, so 12.64, Samyutta Nikaya. So, yeah, good question. The, these are, you know, this is a whole another landscape, but a good one. Um, the four nutriments are, you know, for the body, um, food, um, and then for the mind, contact, intention, and consciousness. And parsing those completely out is difficult. Like there's elements of each within the other of those three. But the Buddha says that those four nutriments are to be understood, not to be abandoned right away. Um, and the path is fabricated. You know, it's, it is conditioned. It is dependent upon nutriments. So you're absolutely right. That right intention is um, part of the path. Um, and only at final awakening do these things, does the mind not need this nutriment anymore? Um, and, and even after awakening, as long as that arhat's alive, there'll still be these residual echoes of, you know, they'll still have conscious, um, they'll still be alive and move around. Um, and, oh, one image I really, I was hoping to bring up in the talk, but I forgot was, uh, yeah, this idea that, we use these path factors on the path, but then they, we can abandon them at the end. Everyone I think is familiar with that analogy of not carrying the raft after you've crossed the river. Mm -hmm. um, but there's another great, um, does anyone here know Banksy? Uh, yeah, he's a graffiti artist in London and they sold one of his paintings. Um, and as soon as the auction finished, the painting promptly shredded itself <laughs> through, the, <laughs> through the frame. So I thought that's a great, analogy for right view. It's like, we use it until we don't need it and then it shreds itself. And <laughs> um, so, but, so e each of these nutriments is to be understood, but they are part of the path. And um, intention in this case is, uh, it's, it's important in a wholesome sense because you are giving up a lot of 
coarse sensory contact on this path. And yet the sense of purpose, of well-being, of aligning your life with something that's real and meaningful. I mean, that's all that intention of that nutriment of intention. That's feeling yourself moving towards something. It's like a bike, you know, as you have movement, it becomes stable and it, it holds you, you know, and it stops wobbling so much. So it, it's a real source of, of um, well-being uh, and it is part of the path. And um, it can be a problem in meditation if that's all there is. And, and that's why uh, that term Sankara um, which is, you know, mental fabrication, which is everything from those fantasies we have in meditation to those, you know, uh, running over the argument again, et cetera, et cetera, the mind wandering. Um, that's all sankara. And the reason the mind churns that out constantly is because, yeah, all the sensory um, contact nutriment has been cut off. And so it just has to kind of churn out a bunch of, of, of that, of junk food, of the intention. But that's not to say that the whole path doesn't have underlying it, a powerful right intention that is part of it. So the nutriments aren't to be abandoned initially, they're to be understood and refined. You know, we don't give up eating, but we do give up as much as we can, the donuts, you know, within reason, you can have donuts, it's okay. <laughs> Does that answer? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, yes. Thank you, Tan. Um, and and I had actually considered uh, the nutrients as junk food, and and we're trying to, you know, sort of switch the diet to something more nourishing, more nutritious. You know. So yeah. thank you. That's a great way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have time for another question if people have it. It's nice to see old and new faces here. Those, Catherine, it's been a long time. <laughs> Wendy, did you have another question or is your hand just residually up? It's nice if it is, it's okay. <laughs> You're welcome to ask though. Just to, you know, um, to say that the nutriments that Sutta I referenced has a very powerful set of images where the Buddha says that how you should regard every nutriment. And this is the famous um, and kind of brutal analogy where he says you should look on food as a parent couple would look on um, if they were crossing the desert and had to kill their child to, to survive, they wouldn't eat for like the taste, they just eat to survive, which is one of the more intense metaphors in the Buddhist canon. So we move past that, but, uh, you know, point taken. Um, but the other three are, uh, and, and they say that if you understand the nutriment of physical food, the five strings of sensuality are comprehended. And there's no more coming back to this world, which means you've attained one of the first three levels. You've become an anagami. Um, you've attained the third level of awakening, maybe not quite arahantship. Um, the nutriment of contact is to be looked at as a cow without skin, leaning up against a wall, a tree, the water or the open air being eaten at by whatever insects live in those environments, um, which is intense. But the idea is that this sort of constant contact, there, there is this constant impingement that's actually somewhat painful if you begin to really see it clearly. Um, and I think there's a very interesting dynamic there with those images in that the cow is initially leaning up against something very coarse. And that's sort of the sensory contact with very coarse things. But in the end, it's just in the air, which is sort of like contact, sensory contact with, you know, very refined, maybe states of meditation or refined sensory contact. So there's less impingement in those states. And if you comprehend that, then you're an arahant. 
Um, and uh, feeling is comprehended completely if you, if you comprehend that. And then the nutriment of intention is to be looked at as a man would look at, um, I think himself being, uh, what is it? Dragged towards a pit of coals. Um, so this idea that there's this, it's, it's hard to exactly know what that one's saying, but something along the lines of moving towards um, something you know will burn you. And if you abandon that, or if you comprehend that nutriment, then you've comprehended um, craving and you, you're an arahant. And the fourth nutriment of consciousness is to be looked at as um, a man being stabbed by many spears every day. Um, and if you understand that, the name and form are comprehended in your arahant. So those are some of the more brutal teachings of the Buddha in the sense that I think they're aimed at quite high levels of practitioner who are being encouraged to let go of those final refined states of, of nutriment and make that final leap to awakening. But it means that, you know, he, he's pulling no punches with them. So it's a very powerful sutta, but quite intense. So, you know, hold it carefully, but it's a good one. I think that um, might be the time we have. If someone has one more quick question, we could do it, or we can go into our longer period of meditation, which Sangamita can introduce, I think. Well, I think I'd sort of pre-introduced it. <laughs> it's yeah. just, um, yeah, sometimes it takes time to really still the mind. And so it's lovely to have several hours where you can um, just keep putting in the conditions. So this is your opportunity now. And, um, and then that period, a uh, long period for sitting or walking meditation uh, will be followed by a break or you can continue meditating. So there's a break from six to seven and then we'll come together for some sitting meditation and then the final Dhamma talk. And we'll come together at 7 p.m. Um, mountain time and yes. six or yeah. yes, mm -hmm. 6 p.m. Pacific time. Okay. Okay, great. Yes, good. <laughs>